the uh, teacher transfer posting and hiring process or the staffing booklet update for 2425. I wanted to start by uh, just reminding everyone that this is um, a document that we work with the board to update every year. It's uh, connected to our collective agreement. It references pieces in our collective agreement. Um, but every year we get a chance to review the document, make sure it's accurate and make some changes based on feedback that we get and based on our interpretation of how things went the previous year. So with that in mind, I would strongly recommend that you read through the entire document after listening to this video or even before uh, to make sure that you understand everything in the document. I'm going to highlight some of the changes and some of the most important pieces throughout the document as I go through this video. So moving on to the second page, the first page of text. The first change that we've made is that the summer staffing process has been shrunken just by a week. What used to happen is that there have been jobs posted in the first two weeks of July. We are not doing that anymore. Only the first week of July will have jobs posted. Interviews may extend into the second week of July, but there will not be new jobs posted in the second week of July. Everything else remains the same, and the purpose of having a freeze period in the summer is so that you can disconnect, you can enjoy your break, and even if you're looking for a new job, a different job, um, you know, permanent status, you get the chance to disconnect and uh, and not have to worry about checking jobs, applying, waiting for interviews, and so on. So that freeze period in the summer means that you can disconnect entirely even if you are looking for a job. So review those dates, make sure you put them in your calendar um, and follow along. I do also wanna be clear that this document looks at postings for jobs for September of 2024. So this process manages hiring for the whole of next school year, even though, number one, we've already had positions that have been posted. So for example, chaplain, department head, and system positions, those have been posted already. And as you'll see in the timeline, we've you know gone past that process. Those people are, are being interviewed and being identified as we speak. Um, and so jobs are also being posted currently that are for immediate assignment. So there are vacancies that still go out to permanent teachers. And one example was the FTK position at St. John's. So I do want to be clear that we are still going to see the potential for permanent jobs or LTO positions posted for immediate assignment between now and the end of June. But this document really focuses on the process for hiring for the 24-25 school year. The next change that was made in this document is just to clarify what happens with partial contracts that are less than 50% if they don't end up going to an internal candidate. So if a teacher at a school is requesting a top up or an increase and there's only a 40% um, vacancy at that school, it may be that the 40% goes to the teacher who has made the request for an increase. However, if there is no eligible teacher or a teacher who has in requested an increase at that school, then that 40% job will likely get posted so that other people can apply. For the remainder of this page, everything is pretty much status quo. Again, I recommend that you read all the way through. On the next page, we have the transfer through postings process. And before we go through this page, I wanna make sure we understand the definitions for hiring, transfer, surplus, and redundant. So hiring is when you have an occasional teacher getting hired to a permanent position. Transfer is when you have a permanent teacher who accepts a new uh, teaching assignment at a different school. So that's a permanent transfer from one school to another. Surplus is, uh, it, it can mean two things. One, it could be the state of a school. So a school could be in a state of surplus, which means that there are too many teachers on staff for the funding that is available. So if there's a decrease in enrollment at a school without any retirements, then it may be that school gets declared to be in a state of surplus. And then what happens is the principal reviews their staffing complement and based on seniority and qualifications and a few other variables, they determine who on that staff is considered to be surplus. So surplus could be the state of the school and surplus could also be something that a teacher is told that they are. So uh, usually every year we see one or a couple of schools where there are some surpluses. This is just based on fluctuations in enrollment, um, but it does happen significantly more frequently than redundancy. Redundancy is when the entire system is uh, in excess, which means that there are too many permanent teachers 
relative to the available funding for the entire board. And this happens through, again, decreased enrollment system-wide. Uh, the term redundant could be used to describe teachers who are low enough in seniority that they are not guaranteed a permanent position for the following school year. And this is much more rare. We know that last year we were kind of teetering on potential redundancy and that had an impact on our staffing timeline and who could apply for what in rounds one and round two, but I'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later on. So again, hiring is occasional to permanent, transfer is permanent assignment to a different permanent assignment, surplus is if the school has too many teachers, and redundancy is when we have too many teachers across the entire system. So when a school has surplus teaching staff, it's not possible to consider consolidations or increases. Again, if the school is in a state of surplus, perhaps they have 22 on staff, and uh, one of the teachers there is 60% uh, and one of the teachers there is 40% and both of those teachers request an increase to 100%. The problem would be if they increased the 60 to 100 and the 40 to 100, that adds at one additional teaching position to that school. If the school is already in a state of surplus, they would not be able to top up those teachers. So when a school is surplus, then top-ups are not possible for teachers at that site. Consolidations are also not possible. A consolidation would be if you're teaching at two schools and then you are uh, interested in consolidating your teaching assignment to only one school. If one of those schools is in a state of surplus, you cannot be consolidated to that site because there's no room for you to be consolidated. When it comes to redundancy, if we don't have any redundancy, then transfers and postings go out as normal. All permanent teaching staff can increase their time or be considered for an increase based on the collective agreement prior to occasional teachers getting jobs. If you are looking for an increase and you've made your request already based on the timelines established in this document and in the collective agreement, then you will be considered as per the language in the collective agreement. However, if the board is in a state of redundancy, consolidations and increases cannot be considered. Similar to what I had mentioned in the previous paragraph, if the, the system is in a state of redundancy, we cannot increase because there are not enough jobs for those who are currently permanent, regardless of their permanent status, whether it's 100% or 50% or less. When it comes to um, how frequently you can apply, Really, if you're a permanent teacher and you apply for a transfer in round one and are successful and accept it, then you cannot participate in any other transfers in round two or three or anything else for the remainder of the 24-25 school year. So if I'm teaching at Bishop Mac and I see a job at St. James, I apply and I'm successful, I am now a St. James teacher for the 24-25 school year. The only exception would be is if there is a vacancy for a position of responsibility or a position of leadership as identified in this paragraph, for example, department head cert, central staff. So I could apply to St. James, accept that transfer, and then also apply to be a department head at a different school or a cert or um, a literacy instructional uh, resource teacher. I can do uh, sort of a vertical move from a school into a position of responsibility but once I accept a lateral move, a transfer from one school to another, I cannot uh, apply or participate for a transfer to a different school um, in an equivalent position. On the next page, we have uh, CERT opportunities. This process uh, has unfolded already. You've probably already seen the pool postings go out twice. Uh, the criteria for hiring CERTs are listed both on the job posting and in this uh, on this page. One thing that we did change was to clarify what it means to have a home school during your first year of discernment. So if you are successful in obtaining a cert position, you have one year to discern whether or not you want to remain a cert for the rest of your career or for the next five years. What happens is if you are not interested in continuing in that cert role, then you have return to site rights, which means that if, for example, I was teaching at Holy Rosary, and I was interested in becoming a CERT, so I applied to the pool and then I got assigned to Mount Forest. If I didn't want to continue in the CERT role, then within that first year, I would make it known that I wanted to return to my school and my home school would be 
Holy Rosary, which is where I was before I became a cert. That applies for the first year. Beyond the first year, you lose those ret return to school rights. Now getting into the timelines for staffing. All of these dates are similar to what they were last year with a little bit of a tweak based on, you know, the fact that this is a leap year, um, but also, um, you know, according to the uh, mutual agreement with principals and with the board, uh, we've made some adjustments, but generally this is very similar to what it was last year. Some of the dates we have already passed, for example, we know that department heads and chaplains have been posted, um, system and central positions have also been posted. The March 1st deadline has passed for collective agreement related um, unpaid leaves for the following school year. Um, March 8th, that's the Friday before March break. This is the deadline for preference forms, and this is for everyone. This is so important. I think teachers un underestimate the importance of your preference forms. This really is the only opportunity to make a request to your principal to have a change in your teaching assignment within your school. It may be in secondary that you're looking for more of one department's courses. It may be in elementary, you're looking for a classroom change, a grade level change, a divisional change. It's gonna depend on your qualifications. Um, you may have a candid conversation with your principal but the preference form is the um, sort of paper copy, well, digital copy of the request that you make to have a change in teaching assignment. Whoops. One thing that I wanted to highlight was the March 28th deadline is not a mandatory deadline. It is a request, a recommendation. It doesn't really appear in the collective agreement but the reason we have this deadline here is that if you know that you're going to resign or retire or make a request through board policy for a personal unpaid leave of absence for a portion of the next year, the earlier you make the request, the easier it is for the board to identify a vacancy and incorporate it into the rounds of postings. You don't have to submit your resignation or retirement by March the 28th. If you are interested or looking at potentially retiring or resigning and you don't want to submit by March the 28th, um, reach out. We'd love to have a conversation. There are legitimate reasons why you may delay submitting your retirement and it may be in your best interests to submit your retirement later than earlier. It may not be and so I just think it's worth having that conversation. Please reach out if you are you know, contemplating retirement. Everything else, uh, you know, uh, mid-April is standard compared to last year. No real changes. Looking at um, getting into the end of April, this is where we start looking at school organizational plans, um, tentative schedules, and uh, tentative assignments for uh, certs. Uh, we have a number of meetings with the board to review where we are. Right? If, if teachers are declared surplus or redundant, we have a chance to sit down with the board and look at all of those things. If teachers have requested an increase or decrease, then we have a chance to sit down and uh, review those uh, lists of teachers. Um, CERT vacancies are an important part of staffing. Um, the board will manage it in their way. We have the pool and we have vacancies and Generally, teachers who are in the CERT pool get assigned a CERT vacancy. There may be some shuffling depending on how long a CERT has been at a specific site, but those decisions are made by the board um, and CERTs are included uh, you know, earlier than the first notice of vacancy. And again, the reason for that is if a CERT is identified uh, coming out of a classroom, then we need to know in advance of the first notice of vacancy so that the vacancy can be posted in that first round. And so here we have May the 6th, first round uh, is being posted. And I just wanna make clear what's in brackets in both the first round and the second round is that only permanent teachers are eligible to participate. So if you're an occasional teacher and you're looking for permanent status, you cannot apply to a job in the first round or the second round. Um, this helps to ensure that permanent teachers have the opportunity to transfer and uh, we also want to ensure that uh, before we get to this May the 29th deadline that there are enough permanent jobs for
teachers who are declared surplus or unassigned to be assigned a job. If we allow occasional teachers to be hired in the first and second round, then permanent vacancies get absorbed and there may not be enough for the teachers who are declared surplus to be guaranteed a permanent job for the following year. So we do restrict round one and round two to permanent teachers only. For anyone who is declared surplus or if they are unassigned for a variety of other reasons, we will meet with human resources and we will assign those teachers to permanent positions on May the 29th. The reason we do that is to guarantee that they have a home, right? If you are surplus and you've been identified as surplus, it's important to know that you have a job for September, a permanent job. And so by the end of the day on May the 29th, you will know where you're going to be in September. You can participate in round one and round two postings. You can actually participate in round three and beyond as well. If you want to uh, continue to compete for jobs um, to give you a little bit of uh, autonomy or control over where you end up, then you absolutely can. It's just that prior to May the 29th, you would be a surplus teacher participating in job competitions. After May the 29th, you would have a home and you could still continue to participate in job competitions. To be clear, if you participate in job competitions as a surplus teacher and you are successful in obtaining a new job, you are not eligible to return to the school from which you've been declared surplus if enrollment increases enough to bring you back. If you are interested in staying where you are, but you're surplus, the best bet would be to accept the new assignment based on the May 29th meeting that we have with HR, and then keep your fingers crossed that enrollment goes up. And if it does, then you have return to site rights. If it doesn't, then you are where we assign you. So there is a bit of a risk by not participating in the transfer process if you are surplus. And again, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out. We're happy to discuss what your options would be based on what you, you actually want. So we have first and second round, then we assign surplus teachers between the second and third round, and anything that remains vacant gets posted into the third round. And this is where daily occasional teachers are eligible to apply to permanent positions. Um, LTO positions would also be posted in the third round. However, if uh, we posted LTOs and filled those positions right away at the beginning of the third round, it's likely that some of the people who were successful in obtaining the LTO positions would also continue to compete for permanent positions. And if they were successful in obtaining the permanent position, then we would have to repost the LTO that had already been filled. So you will notice, and it has been our practice in the past, that LTO positions are not filled immediately at the beginning of round three. Usually permanent positions are filled. And if occasional teachers are successful in obtaining those permanent positions, then it's better than obtaining an LTO and then obtaining a permanent position and then the board having to repost the LTO. So again, there may be a bit of a delay in filling LTO positions if there are a large number of permanent positions posted in round three. Anything beyond round three gets posted. It's just that it's not listed here. We have language to sort of capture rounds, ones, rounds one, two, and three. We don't have any language specifically beyond round three. However, it is by mutual agreement that we work out how we're going to continue to post. So uh, if there are still permanent positions that have not been filled um, either through round one and two, they remain vacant or after round three, they lead to backfilling. For example, I'm teaching at Bishop Mack and I am successful in obtaining a position at St. James. That vacancy at Bishop Mack ends up going to uh, round two or beyond. Um, if that happens in round two or round three, where I accept a transfer, then the vacancy might not appear until round four. So you can see how rounds one, two, and three might not be enough to get through all the permanent vacancies that will exist within the system. And so when we get beyond round three, as it says here, any remaining unfilled permanent or LTO positions beyond the third round shall be posted and filled according to a process 
uh, and timeline that is determined by mutual agreement between the board and OECTA and subject to summer restrictions outlined in the booklet and or the collective agreement. So a really fancy way to say we'll be in constant conversation with HR just to make sure that all the vacancies get filled and that we're not um, going you know, through the middle of July and that collective agreement provisions are also respected. And so that's it. You know, the end of June is when all teachers should receive their tentative timetables in secondary uh, in elementary. Your tentative timetable uh, is provided a little earlier. I do want to highlight the tentative uh, element of timetables that are provided. Um, changes in enrollment over the summer can sometimes lead to, lead to changes in teaching assignment. And we did see a number of permanent jobs that were hired for uh, in September of 2023 as a result of a number of permanent positions being uh, assigned to permanent teachers as they transferred from one school to another and then the backfill process, the domino effect continued. So uh, everything is tentative by the end of June. Hopefully by the time we get to September, things get firmed up. Again, this is the staffing booklet it's through a collaborative process between the board and OECTA. We change it every year. Uh, I hope that uh, you do get the chance to read through the entire document. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, I hope this helps. Have a great day. Thanks so much for watching.